The world's most popular fillet knife. A knife that you might say is one in a million, especially when you see how it gets made for the outdoors, halfway around the world. People are passionate about outdoor equipment. Get this, Americans spend more than $20 billion a year on gear. But no one ever really sees how their stuff gets made. Well, that's where we come in. Each week, we throw open the factory doors and give you a behind the scenes look at how your favorite gear is made. Made for the outdoors. If you fish, odds are you own at least one of these knives. <laughs> I happen to own a bunch, so does my dad, and many of them, well, they've seen better days. Rappel-up fillet knives are about as iconic as any piece of outdoor gear around, and they're quite the story, especially when you see how they get made halfway around the world. To understand the legacy of a blade is to go to the source. This place, this town, Rovaniemi, a Finnish city on the Arctic Circle made famous by a big guy in red. Yep, Rovaniemi, hometown of Santa Claus. No joke. Just down the road from Kris Kringle's castle, another workshop. This one dedicated to the perfection of the edge. A knife factory started in 1928 by Yane Martini, a humble Finnish blacksmith who peddled his wares from a bike. It was so sharp knife with a good price. Martini knives became Finnish tradition, used by woodsmen and reindeer herders in the harsh Arctic environment. These days, Martini employs 50 craftsmen and women who build on Yanni's 90-year legacy. No doubt we are the biggest knife manufacturer for fillet knives in the world. Tradition is our, I would say, it's our heritage, and it's the best we have. Martini knives focused on the local lifestyle, people who lived off the Arctic landscape, what Martini called links and lap knives. If you go to the forest, it's the life. You, you need it. In 1964, a single drawing would shake up Martini's tradition. In 65, actually, we got the first fillet knives made. And that was the huge success for this company. A new fishing knife with a thin bendable blade, a concept completely foreign to Finnish anglers. They were saying, what is that? What is not the knife with the flexible blade? It's not the knife. Little did they know. The design, the idea of Minnesota fishing innovators and Normark Rapala president Ron Weber. They put pencil to paper to draw on a concept sharpened it very thin, made it very sharpened and flexible, and sent a sample to U.S. That was the start. The start of a legacy now owned by literally millions of anglers around the world. In fact, Martini often manufactures more than a hundred of these knives a day. The entire process starts with a bunch of boxes, pallets that come from either Germany or France for very good reason. Those two countries are known for this stuff, hardened steel. Workers unload and stack the raw stock steel. They go into a giant grinder that trims the back of the blade. All it's doing is grinding the back of the knife. Might not seem like much, but in knife building, it's a big deal. Next, another grinder. They angle both the sides. The magic number is 22 degrees, and they say that's what makes their knives different. Like we said, it's sharpest since 1928. 
We are trying to keep that quality and going in and going. Wong Xiao programs all the knife grinders, a job born out of his boyhood dream to work here. When you tell them to do something, they do, and they don't complain much. Well, sometimes. 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 Blades that don't quite make the grade, or here they call it the cut, stand up in the barrel. Blades that cut the mustard go onto this conveyor. That whole side has these sort of scrubbing wheels. They're kind of rough. And then they move down this side, polishing wheels. They come in rough, they come out completely mirror-like on the other side. And you hear that little pop? That's a tiny squirt of wax to help polish. I can't get my nose too close here. In two minutes, the blades come out ready to go. Straight ahead, Finland's version of the robot dance. And we sweat it out. Finally some heat in this country. Made for the Outdoors is brought to you by Magnum Research. Otter Outdoors, Ice Castle Fish Houses, Banks Outdoors, and by Waltons. Makes sense that the hometown of Santa Claus might look like this. Come December days, Rove Niemi, Finland gets both winter seasons at once. You know, the snow and cold. Tourists covet this Arctic town. Here, tradition cuts deep, especially when you go behind closed doors at the town's historic factory. Inside, Martini's 50 artisans grind away their days, working the business of blades. With Rapala filet knife steel now cut, shaped, and shined, each piece takes a break for a bath. The blades enter a wash station that cleans off protective oil and any residue from the production process. It's a three-stage dipping process that can catch you off guard. It's tricked me 15 times now, maybe 16. 17. <laughs> and finally, the knives come out the end. Nope. It's the machine that refuses to let us see the finished product. Come on! Oh, nope. 22. Oh, hot knives. Get your hot knives. Fresh, hot, clean knives. Finally. With the knife blades properly prepped, we move across the street to another of Martini's magic production stops. The old Finnish woodshed. Wow, look at that. This is our wood stock. We use regular birch each year, over 120 cubic meters. A lot. Yes. Yari Alme oversees Martini's massive raw stock of wood. The company uses several species of wood for handles, including a rare regional specimen called curly birch. What's that coloring or that marbling? And it's very expensive. The unique birch grows ever so slowly in this cold environment, and only in a small area right along the border of Finland and Russia. When, when you plant it, it takes about 50 years to get some profit. First, the wood sits out here for a year in the cold and dark, biding its time naturally curing. Wow, look at all this. Unbelievable. Only then does it go inside for processing. A worker cuts lengths down to size and perpetually feeds pieces into a planer. That machine levels and cuts even strips of birch. Good product goes onto the cart, scraps end up in a bin. Next step, 
a fast saw, and even faster hands. He cuts each handle right to length. The smaller, rare pieces of wood get even more TLC. He's sculpting a bit. He's not just cutting. He actually looks for the best pieces and tries to get them just right. The end result, bins full of handles, just about ready for production. But not before one last rest. Finally, some heat in this country. I know you can't feel it, but it's about 100, maybe 110 degrees in here. After the wood gets cut, all of it comes in here and it'll sit for about one week. Think of it as a final drying stage. Only then do workers stack the birch and feed it to a monster. Yep, this monster. The machine does about 10 tasks at once. It takes those dried blocks and cuts and shapes each one. An internal router also carves out a spot for the blade. It takes just a couple of seconds for blocks of finished birch to become perfectly shaped Rapala knife handles, now ready to join the blade. Up next, workers put the hammer down and find out how World War II blitz bombing changed Martini's knife-making legacy forever. Made for the Outdoors is brought to you by Topper Easy Lift, Aquarius Home Services, Mulching Mania, Minnesota Trailer Manufacturing, and by Central Boiler. Finland's Martini knife artisans craft all kinds of outdoor knives, each built on Finnish legend and lore. Except for this blade, the long ago brainstorm of a couple of Minnesota fishermen. With Rapala fillet knife blades prepped and handles properly cut, it's time to watch parts become a single piece. Tero Tulianen stacks handles into this special machine. A press wedges a metal ferrule onto the handle. Tero then preps hundreds of handles to go to the next desk. The spot where four martini parts become one knife. Just watch. First, Tero taps the handles onto the blade. Then, he adds a rivet and hammers that into place. Next, he grinds off the excess back of the blade and then finally locks the rivet into place for good. Everything is done by feel. If he taps too hard to break the handle or knock out the blade, if he grinds and it's not quite right, screws the whole thing up. Uh, he makes that look so easy. Like that, a rapple of fillet knife takes shape. Even though each looks whole, they're still quite a ways from being complete. Maria Kudina picks up the next step. She stirs a secret stew that will cover and protect each handle. Once mixed, Maria slowly and very carefully loads a rack of 90 knives. She sets the machine pressure and then gently dips the handles. Maria will dip a couple more times to build up a protective layer. While that batch dries, we make a quick dash across town to a most unique building. This is what everyone has. Mm -hmm. Where we are is, is an old factory of Martini knives. Oli Sipinen shows us around Martini's original building, what she calls the house. It's a building nearly 80 years old and an absolute legacy structure in this Finnish town. See, during World War II, the Germans tried to invade Northern Finland, what Finns still call the Lapland War. Germans repeatedly bombed the town of Rovniemi, essentially destroying almost every structure in town. Well, almost. The story says that we had a bomb downstairs, but it never worked. But don't worry, the bomb is already moved, removed, so it's not there anymore. Phew, I feel better. 
only a few of Martini's original knife-making tools survived the war. These tools, they were very, very valuable, so during the war they were sent it to Sweden and they were waiting there when the war was over and then they came back. Now museum guests can sort through all the history, all these old pieces that helped Yanni Martini grow from a humble blacksmith to a Finnish legend. And over in that special glass case, I spot something peculiar. Look at that. Here is, is the filleting knife that wow. makes us famous in America. Yep, the originals. And I think we are still selling a lot of these filleting knives. Lots of them. Around the world, literally. The quality and the price and the name. And the story. And the story, yeah, that's true. Up next, we finish up the knives. <laughs> finish. Made for the Outdoors is brought to you by Appledorn's Resort. Select Minnesota GMC dealers. Powers Machining Incorporated. And by Minnesota Horse and Hunt Club. Hey there, I'm Bill Shirk. And I'm Lindsay Hayes. If you're a fan of Made for the Outdoors and want to know more about upcoming episodes, be sure to like us on Facebook. And also follow us on Instagram for cool behind the scenes looks at what we're working on. And you know what? If you've got an idea for a show, be sure to drop us a note. High noon during Finland's winters looks like this. Sunlight shines just a few hours a day during winter solstice. No matter, people in Rovniemi, Finland learn to live with Arctic winter conditions. It might be dark outside, but inside the local knife factory, no bright lights needed. Martini's got a laser. So that's the laser machine. That's where a Rapala knife kind of earns its stripes. It's a little tough to see inside, but each Rapala knife goes in looking like this and comes out looking like that. A quick spot check to make sure the logo looks right and good to go. A second laser machine engraves each Rapala knife blade with the Martini name. It takes just a quick second or two. Now, the final work gets uh, a little bit edgy. Martini's knife sharpeners sit at sharpening machines all day long, touching wax to wheel and buffing blades. It takes steady, strong hands to sharpen steel. How do you really know it's ready? Yeah, it's because we got to try it. Oh, the paper, of course. Okay. Here's the thing, not all martini sharpening is slow by hand work. Combination of technology and human touch. Here you find about the only non-human process. For Rapala fillet knives, the robot sharpening step might be the most important. For very good reason too. Watch and I'll explain. See, the robot first grabs a knife and moves it over to a sharpening wheel. It grinds the blade to a razor-sharp finish at just the right angle. Remember, 22 degrees. It then reverses the blade and hones the other side. In this step, the secret to the robots. See, they are exact. The computer-controlled machines get every knife sharpened exactly right, no human error, and each knife gets the exact same grind. Again, no human error. For these fillet knives, that edge must be robot sharp. This sharpness comes from the knowledge from generations to generations, since 1928. After grinding, the machine cleans and washes the blade one final time. Oh, and after Martini's workers go home for the night, <laughs> these poor robots still earn their keep. They run all day and all night long makes you wonder if they ever get lonely. Don't worry, boys, I'll keep you company.
like that, the fillet knives are finely finished and ready to go out the door and onto store shelves all over the world. A simple blade built on 90 years of passion. I would love to say it's martini knife because it's made in martini. But of course, the design is, the original design is from Rappel actually. So I would say it's both. No matter the name, what's important? These people behind the process. What I feel here, the people who are working for us, uh, is that they want to be proud what they do. And they very much value, you know, that this product is so international, so widely all over the world. So now you know the whole story behind Rapala Filet Knives, designed by Rapala and made by Martini, a relationship that is definitely a cut above the rest. <laughs>